Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. We are here with Matthew Pose, and we are here with Don Dunn, and we're going to be talking about room curves. How do you calibrate your home theater to get the best sound? What do you say? Don? Don's answer to that is just crank the bass up, crank it to a volume 11. It's, we're gonna set that, that shit set that shit to where you like it and screw the experts <laughs> that's, that's what i'm talking about in the case well, the the day, doesn't it? it is it is what it is it is it's look it's your system you should enjoy it if yeah. you happen to have a certain but amount sir, of bass that you prefer it's acoustically correct sir shut up i can't hear my rears <laughs> yeah put it in all channel stereo and everybody will be happy pretty much <laughs> So I did ask uh, Matt to put together a slide presentation and it's on our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audioholics if you patrons want to follow along. And I think it's important to define what a room curve is because every room correction system kind of sets a target, right? I mean, they set up a calibration to what they think people would prefer to listen to. So I wanted Matt to go over the science of this and then talk about the real world applications, what we actually do in the field when we're calibrating real world science. systems. Science. Well, and we'll, science. we'll in science, yeah. We'll get into this, of course, with the uh, the presentation talking about some of the science behind this. But I also mentioned that when we're doing this in real life in the field, what Don said is actually an important reality. Not that everybody does it this way, but the way I do it, I know Don, you tend to agree with this, is that it starts with what the client wants. So ultimately it's not about what I think is right or what I want. I might start there just as a baseline and say, all right, so here's kind of a baseline level. Usually what I give people is actually three choices. And the thing that I'm playing with is the base level and the treble level. So you smooth it all out, you elevate the base, you turn the treble down a little bit, and then you do an extra three decibels of bass or six decibels of bass. You turn the treble down an extra three decibels. 20 for Don, there you go. And then you let the client listen to it with some music they're familiar with or a movie scene they're familiar with, and you go from there. But at the end of the day, the final curve you get is what they like, or at least that's, I think, how you should be approaching it. Well, look, the other important aspect you never hear anyone talking about is <laughs> bass level can really also be determined by how linear your response is. So if you flatten out all those bumps in your response and you get smooth bass for every seat, you could crank the bass up higher and not hear bad resonances, and it's pleasing. So when we talk about boosting the bass 10 or 15 dB, we're talking about linear bass, not bass that has you know 20 or 30 dB dips and, and peaks within the response. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Well, there's a lot of... Go ahead, Don. No, don't get me wrong. Listen, I think you should always start off with the bass, uh, not the bass, but this the bass level of your of your calibration should be absolutely correct. Then let the client do demos and play things for the client and let the client guide you on where they want to be. I mean, I think that's what's important, but you you have to have something to start from. Yeah. And we use these target curves to give us a, a place to kind of flatten it. To it's kind of a reference point. point. A reference point. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and the other thing I mentioned, you, you talked about how when the bass is really peaky, it tends to make the bass sound louder and people might turn it down. That's those resonances are ringing. So if you look at the way that the bass decays over time, what you'll see is everywhere there's a peak, there's an extended amount of time that the bass takes to decay. So getting that all smoothed out evens out the decay time. And so you don't hear that ringing anymore. And that's an important part of this. Yep. All right. So we're going to share the screen here and uh, Matt, I'm going to let you run with this. All right. I'm going to make it bigger so I can actually read it. So target curves, what to know in a little history. I can get the slide. There we go. So um, one of the first approaches to a target curve, a lot of folks know came from B and K, and they had this optimal hi-fi curve for in-room. It was derived from research that they published in 1974. Basically, what they did was they took five loudspeakers that were evaluated for sound quality, and then they created this very smooth curve that matched well with the ideal preferred curve. So they just kind of came up with this when they basically took speakers and said, which one do you like? And people liked particular speakers, and they measured the in-room response, and they kind of drew a smooth line through that response and came up with an average that looks something like this. And one of the points that you can take from this is that very clearly that's not a flat line. It's a smooth line, but the bass is elevated and the treble is reduced. And so it was a sign early on that we don't really like it when the system sounds dead flat. We seem to like the bass to be elevated. But when you look at this, one of the things you'll notice is that, so here you can kind of see 
we've got 60, 70, 80, 90 decibels. So if you look at this in here, there's really only about, what is that, about six decibels difference between the highest frequencies and the low frequencies there. So mm -hmm. it, there's clearly a curve to it, but it's not real extreme. And more research was done to figure out really what people like, especially with newer, better speakers. So let's, let's go back to what the actual B and K paper said and why any kind of curve was needed. So what they noted was that recordings were recorded naturally in the far field, had a suitable amount of direct and reflected sound, and the preference curve tended to be flat when that was the nature of it. So in other words, that curve, if you will, the, the uh, extra emphasis of low frequencies that happens when you do have a, a higher amount of reflected sound already emphasizes the bass. But most recordings are not mixed that way. They tend to be mixed. Uh, I'm sorry, they tend to be a mix of near and far and the bass boost is required. So basically because the way most recordings are made, you need to add in some extra bass. This was the claim that BNK was making. Uh, to note at this point, nearly 50 years later, the studio recordings are largely direct recordings only. In other words, when this was done, a lot of recordings were being done in more like live venues or in studios that would have been more of a mimicking of a live venue. As time progressed, that became less and less true to the point that, that at this point, really, everything tends to be done in a studio with fairly rare exception and is a direct recording, meaning that the mic is either right on the instrument or they're just plugging it right in. Uh, the BNK paper doesn't account for the fact that the engineers are recording, EQing, and balancing sound based on what they hear on a system of unknown quality and the response itself. In other words, the circle of confusion problem. So the issue here comes back to the whole, the, the curve is needed. We know, but when they try to place blame on the nature of the recording itself, one of the problems we have is that so much EQing of that recording is happening in a system of unknown quality that I'm, Gene and Don, you've certainly experienced this before. You've listened to music. One artist sounds great. Another artist you listen to, the treble's way too high or the bass mm. is way too high or whatever. Like uh, it's clearly not sure. EQ'd right. Yeah. And you could argue that it's like your system, but usually it's not. You know, like you know your system sounds good with the majority of recordings and then you get this one recording that it clearly doesn't sound good with. So... Uh, Floyd Toolhead actually talked a lot about this and he explains the reason for it. I think that there's this kind of mysticism, if you will, that whatever's done in the studio must be right mm -hmm. and that they make no mistakes. And so we as listeners need to match that. And the reality is that there's just, there's not a lot of standards and there's a lot of people with different crazy ideas in the studios, just like there's a lot of people like us with crazy ideas out here. And sometimes it can lead to really bad recordings. I mean, we've speculated for some of these artists, it could be that the engineer's hearing is going and he compensated, didn't realize. It could just be his personal preference. Well, the other thing too is some of the speakers that these studios use, like I think Yamaha, was it the NS10 or NS11? It's not NS10 a very, out. Yeah, it's not a very linear speaker, right? By today's standards, our home theater speakers destroy it. Right, yeah, it's not a great speaker. Well, it, yeah. it could be the equipment from back in the day too when things were recorded. You know, a lot of these recordings we listen to were recorded in the 60s and 70s. Especially Smelly Cat. You like to listen to that a lot, though. Smelly Cat, Smelly Cat, <laughs> what are they feeding you? So now we're going to get into Don's favorite research. <laughs> so this Joey. is the Har Harman target curve. So a lot of people know this. And part of me wanted to do this particular presentation to kind of say, you know, Harman target curve to me feels like the wrong way to describe this because they didn't really go out to set a target curve that everybody's supposed to do. What they were trying to do is better understand the preferred in-room response of a loudspeaker. So you've got the natural response of a speaker, which is being shown here. And then you've got a different response, which I want you to look over in the left one. You can kind of see it in the right as well. The black line there that shows the elevated base and the slightly reduced treble. And if you look at the right one, you can kind of see the same thing going on there. That very closely uh, mimics what ended up ultimately being what we often call the Harman target curve. And there's a couple of things here. So if you take a speaker that has typical directivity and a perfectly flat linear response in an anechoic chamber, and then you stick it into a room with a normal amount of reflections, what you tend to see is a, a line that actually over here, I think they show it in red. It's really hard to see, unfortunately. You can see it on the right side in red, though. But it's more of a like a wedge shape. 
And you'll notice that there's sort of a dog leg or an inflection point right around 100 hertz or a little higher than 100 hertz in the preferred curve. So it turned out, I actually asked about that. So I, I um, was messaging Todd Welty and I said, do you know why that happened? And he said, he, I, I'm going to forget all the details, so I don't want you to think I'm quoting him. But he said something along the lines that when they were going through and trying to figure out what the preferred target curve should look like, they were finding that if they made that wedge shape and then they elevated the base to the level that people liked, it tended to make it sound muddy and boomy. But if they added that inflection point, it allowed mm. them to raise the base without also causing that muddiness or that boominess. And so it turned out to actually be an important part of it. Where's that inflection point at? It's hard to see on the graph. It looks like it's right around 150 hertz or so in the picture, maybe 200 yeah. hertz, something like that. I, yeah, I can't. I, unfortunately, this was small. I just grabbed it out of the paper. So here, actually, this gives a better view. So it looks like it's pretty close to 200 hertz. So this shows roughly what the preferred response was for... Well, okay, so the first one I want to mention is that response I was telling you. You take this perfect speaker with typical directivity in a typical room, and you get that dotted line there that has sort of a wedge shape to it. About a six decibel difference or so, maybe not even, maybe four, four or five decibels uh, between the treble and the highs. Then you've got one that's a little higher than that, and that's the trained listeners only one. So they took trained listeners, they said, which one do you like? And you can see the treble is reduced quite a bit. So if we look there, we look like we're probably about minus five at 20 kilohertz and plus five maybe in the base. So there's about a 10, diff 10 decibel difference between the highest frequencies and the lowest frequencies there. You've got the all listeners one, that's just the average of all of it together. And then you've got this other one here, that's that smaller dotted line that says untrained listeners. You can see the base is elevated quite a bit more. And then the treble actually is a little bit elevated. It's not flat anymore. And that particular response that kind of almost has that typical smiley face that a lot of people back in the 70s and 70s, 80s would do yeah. to their graffiti EQs. Hey, yeah. hey, hey, Matt, can I ask you a simple question? What the hell is a trained listener? Well, so it, it was a way that they were categorizing people. And so it just referred to professionals. I mean, it could have been, the, I mean, Harmon has a training that they offer. And so they let people sometimes go through that. And then the other thing that's mm -hmm. been used as trained listeners would be professionals, people that work in the industry in some way and have, have are considered good yeah. listeners. Incidentally, right. most of the, tr most of the listeners in the Harmon uh, study, uh, the least ones that were consistent were re professional reviewers from what right. I remember. Like, they, they were some they, of the lowest scored uh, listeners. Right. Think about that train listener. Seriously, that's the dumbest shit I've ever heard of in my life. Train listener. <laughs> so, so like, the real seriously. issue here is that the untrained listener—that's that's Don's preference curve. So he doesn't. You're like an untrained it. listener. He doesn't like it because that's his curve. <laughs> no, I, 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 people like what they like, dude. I, how you train well, somebody? Was that Pavlov's dog? You hit a button when they hit. I'll, a frequency? I'll also mention. I mean, seriously. I mean, that's the dumbest shit I've ever heard. Well, but Don, you can take people through a training, and you can provide them this is with it right here, Don. references it's for nice accuracy dude, before they it's listen dumb. to music. There you go. Dumb, it's dumb shit, dude. Sorry. Science. You talk about statistically how people prefer. You know, you have different. Right. You know. Right. So. Um, I will mention, though, there are speakers that tend to me measure more like the untrained listeners one for the in-room mm. response. Gene, you and I have talked. In fact, I think that was partly the impetus for this. We were talking about some speakers that tend to measure a little bit more bright. And Clitch. I don't happen to like them. I tend to think they sound bright. You like them. Um, and tend well, it's because we're, we're old and our hearing is a little bit. Yeah, you know, that's true. I mean, that's, I... that's that's just humanity, dude. As yeah. you get older, your hearing gets worse. I mean, it's true. I mean, 20 years ago, I couldn't listen to a clip speaker, and now all of a sudden, we're well, they're getting better, but <laughs> they they are, wow. the, the 8000s, those are good speakers. I mean, there's yeah. some of their newer horn technology, and I have the Klipsch Heritage soundbar in my room, and I'm, I love the thing. I mean, it's yeah, it's a little bright. I could tell it's no, bright. I, I hear what you're like saying, it. man. I'm not trying to torpedo what you're saying, I'm just like. And some of this shit just like, come on, man, really? You know what I mean? Well, so so back to this, though. I actually had a conversation with a, a friend of mine uh, from Soundfield Audio. So his name's AJ. And we were talking about, like, can you do something to a speaker intentionally to make it preferred in stores? So, you know, Don, if you got like an audio shop and you set it up, can you put speakers in the room and actually design the speaker to be the winner, even if it's the worst speaker? And... Essentially, what he said was exactly this, 
that if you make it look like that untrained listener response for the in-room response, even if it's the technically wrong response, it's the one that people tend to pick out much more easily as the preferred one. And I think at audio shows, when you see the kinds of speakers that people are like, that is the best speaker at the audio show, it often is the one that has that little bit brighter treble. Yeah, the boom and the space. Yeah, people like that. And so I think, and that's why I actually warn people, like when you're doing, when you're going to Best Buy or you're going to a high-end audio shop or you're going to these audio shows, be careful about making strong judgments from quick listening tests and stuff like that. Because often that boom and sizzle, as you put it, Gene, is the one you're going to gravitate to. Mm -hmm. But after you've listened to it over time, it may not be the one you like. Something that measures a little bit more like the all listeners curve, if you will, might actually be the, the better one. That might be the, the speaker you ultimately prefer. That's why uh, A-B testing, there's some problems with instantaneous A-B testing. You know, you need to really spend some time listening to each speaker, in my opinion, because I would gravitate towards the one that's got more bass and treble until the thing starts fatiguing you over time, right? Yeah. But, you know, thankfully, we live in a world today where it's actually not that hard to change the general shape of the response for a speaker. Right. So if it does have too much boom and sizzle, as long as it's otherwise a good speaker, you could potentially turn it down. Like per listen plus 50%. Yeah. You All right. Them. So let's talk a little bit about that estimated in-room response because I used it for some later stuff. So I just want to make sure people know what it is. So the estimated in-room response is, a, is predicted from the anechoic free space data and contains the weighted average, which is 12% the listening window, 44% early reflections, and 44% sound power. And this is used to derive an estimate of the steady state in-room response but it's not the same as perception in a room. So what I want to point out is just because this is a prediction of what it would measure like in a room doesn't mean that that's your preference or how you would perceive it. Okay. All right. So are these targets accurate? Is everything fair game? Well, the in-room response of a speaker does not follow the same general trajectory for all speakers. A speaker's directivity will impact significantly the natural tilt of the steady state response. So remember, I just mentioned that to make a prediction of the in-room response, which is really accurate for those who think, well, it's a prediction. In fact, Gene, you gave me a hard time once because I did one of these presentations and I included a lot of predictions. And you're like, you, we can't do this. you got to go back and do real in-room measurements. And I'm like, Gene, they're going to be like 85, 90% the same. And you're like, no, no, I've got to do the real ones. And I went back and did the real ones. And just to prove a point, I actually overlaid the real in-room measurement from the speaker with the predicted measurement. And it was like everything but the base looked identical. There yeah. was otherwise no difference. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, actually. They are you very, know, very I'm, good. I'm, a, I'm all about proving it, not just looking at the theory. So I appreciate you doing that. Yep, we did both. Um, so the directivity of the speaker is huge. And you can see that from that last slide that talked about how important the uh, listening window and then the reflected response was in creating that predicted in-room response. Now, the point at which the tweeter begins to beam will vary with the tweeter type and could create a significant natural roll-off that should not be corrected. In other words, if you've got a speaker whose directivity is naturally essentially collapsing, if you will, it's just getting much, much narrower as you get into the higher frequencies, if you start to boost the treble too much, you're not what you perceive is not what you're seeing in that steady state response. You're actually perceiving more of the direct sound than what that response shows. So if you boost it, you're gonna make it too bright. So how do we measure this more accurately then? Should you, would a spatial average fix this or is it the same problem? No, you would still see the same thing. A spatial average is still gonna be accumulating the same kind of mix of reflected and direct sound. So, <clears throat> I mean, how do you fix it? Uh, you have to know what you're looking for in the measurements and understand. But what I really tell people is just follow the curve. So whatever the speaker does naturally in the room, you should stick with that. And then if you're going to raise the treble level, you should be doing that because it sounds like it's not bright enough for your preference, not yeah. because you think it's supposed to be more flat. Good point. All right, so when EQing, it may be best to follow the curve, what I just said. A speaker's in-room response is not indicative of what we hear. So again, remember, the steady state response doesn't equal what you hear. You're going to be hearing more of the direct response that you're not showing in that. The in-room response is a total of the sound energy in the room and includes the effect of many reflections. Two ears and a brain can hear through the room and focus more on the direct sound than what the mic can do. And the speaker's directivity also impacts the preferred target curve. So we'll get into that later, but... The speaker's directivity, <clears throat> if it deviates substantially from what is kind of typical of a speaker, can also change pretty dramatically what a appropriate target curve would be. So it, again, if you're doing something like taking that preferred, that preference curve that Harmon came up with, and you're applying it to a speaker with very narrow directivity, 
it's probably actually going to make that speaker sound too bright. Hmm. All right, so here we're going to compare some speakers where I want to make this point. So this is the anechoic response of two different speakers that we measured. This is the anechoic response of the speaker uh, on axis. It might have been the listening window, but I think this is the on axis response. And so you can see they're both really good, right? They both measure very, very flat. That looks pretty reasonable. And you probably from this alone would say, well, I, I think the in-room response is probably going to look pretty similar on these two as well, right? Actually, they don't because of very different directivity. So mm -hmm. the one on the right, which is the Perlison S7T, which has that really, really flat, smooth response. And then here we have the predicted in-room response. And you can see that it kind of follows a really nice curve shape to it. That's really consistent with, for instance, what Harmon had said would be a nice uh, response. <laughs> on the right, on the left, I mean, we see actually this weird dip. And if you looked at that dip, you might be like, well, that's goofy. You need to fix that. You shouldn't fix it. It's actually due to a directivity issue with that particular speaker. I'm not going to mention what it is yet. But uh, that directivity, what happens is the woofers in that speaker are actually more directional than the tweeter is when it comes in. And as a result, what you're seeing is that the off-axis response uh, has some nulls in it, which are showing up in the predicted in-room response. How could the woofer be more directional than the tweeter? In this particular case, it's because there's multiple woofers next to each other. Oh, okay. So it's a lobing issue. It is. And if you were to EQ that out, it would make, and actually we did. So, uh, Gene, you and I listened to the speaker together in your room, and initially we EQ'd it flat, and it didn't sound right. It sounded too bright, and I had to play around with it a little bit more. Now, I had not actually measured the speaker outside yet, so I didn't know that. I, I didn't know it for a year. Mm -hmm. so that's how long it took me to finally get it measured. And um, it took us a while to get that response right, but I tried to match it to your speakers by making identical in-room response curves. But the two speakers had very different directivity. And when we did that, if you remember, it sounded really bad with female jazz vocals. What's interesting right. about that is both sets of speakers had multiple drivers, multiple mid-range drivers, too. Well, they one did. was a horn and one was a ribbon. Yes. Yeah. All right. So room EQ of speakers with off-axis dip. So here I'm showing you actually what we did. So as I mentioned, we kind of screwed this up. So I didn't know and just assumed that it had a different kind of directivity uh, curve to it than it did. And we made it look like that blue line. Um, and ultimately it looked really flat and smooth and we thought it was good. But when we were listening to, as I said, some female vocals in particular, it was pretty edgy. It was, it was grating at times. Um, and overall had a very different timbre to your speaker. I mean, I think it, it didn't match. We actually were, were not particularly happy with the sound of that. And I had introduced, um, some dips and such to try to like, I was just going by ear and just changing the EQ to try to get it to be more natural sounding to me. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I don't have, we never measured it after I did that because I was just playing. If you recall, we were kind of struggling to get it to sound right. We weren't really measuring it. We were just adjusting it and listening. And so I didn't, I couldn't find a measurement from that day, but I remember that we had introduced a lot of EQ that was, should have been pretty unnatural, but it actually made the speaker sound better. Well, and as I said, it was a year later that I measured it and realized why. Go ahead. You Don. should have probably called Joe and tell to get his $1,200 calibration. It would have fixed all this shit. Magic beans. There you go. <laughs> I think he would have gone with what you see in that blue line, which like I said, turned out to be a mistake. Kid. So here actually is uh, that Perlison one. Um, and what it's showing is uh, Gene to you. Now there's some stuff going on here that kind of makes this look different, but you can see um, in the predicted room response, there was no subwoofers. You have that actually connected to some subwoofers in your room. And this yeah. came from some measurements you had sent me. It was the only in-room measurements I had uh, quickly to grab for this. So I think there's also EQ going on, right? Your system has A little some... bit, not much, just GEQ on the Morantz. I didn't put any Odyssey on it. Oh, okay. Um, and that's, it's, it's very flat in this particular case. The base rise is actually happening. It looks like below 50 Hertz. Yeah. That's the jail subs taking over. Right. All right. Now here is, um, some more measurements of in-room speakers. This is just to kind of show you guys the natural shape that speakers tend to take in a room. So these are those rebels you have. Right the, behind me. Yeah. Yep. And, and they're considered a really good speaker. They have a really good measured response. And uh, you typically would expect them to uh, 
have a good natural shape to them in a room. And you can see it's not bad. I mean, you can also see, Gene, you've complained about them being a little bit too lean and not having enough base. Yep. And I think when you look at this, you can see it definitely doesn't match the preferred curve, for instance, that Harmon came up with. It's at best kind of close to that B and K curve. There's a slope to it, but it's not a yeah. lot. And then you ran ARC, which made a little bit of correction to it. It definitely seemed to lower the trouble level relative to the base. Um, but I think you've ultimately said this was not enough for you. You really would like to see more base than what this is showing. Yeah, there's, it, there's definitely, and I'm going to test these in a different room, but I definitely think the uh, base level is too low on the speaker like this, especially yeah, for $16,000 a pair with three eight inch drivers and a large cabinet. I mean, it should have stimulated the base response in the room. Now I do have a problem in that room. You see that 40 Hertz suck out relative to where I'm sitting. The real solution to this problem is to put a subwoofer in the room. Yeah. Well, the 8300 8, RBHs that also have three eights didn't have any much better base response. Yeah. Correct? So this is a this is a difficult room. All right. So let's talk about something else. And I brought this in because Odyssey does this, and this is the BBC dip. So I mentioned before that how you EQ really needs to be focused on the speaker's directivity. It's not about creating this flat end response, and it's not about matching that that preferred curve or that target curve. And the reason I say that is because depending on the speaker's directivity, doing so can actually introduce some problems. As I mentioned in that other speaker, we EQ'd mm -hmm. it flat, but it didn't actually have, it shouldn't have had a flat end room response because of its directivity, made the speaker sound really bright. Well, BBC figured that out too. And it has to do with the fact that especially back then, but still largely true today, when you take a typical woofer, something like a six and a half inch mid bass driver, or an eight inch mid bass driver, that, that would be even worse. And you try to mate it in a two way speaker to a one inch dome tweeter. There's just no way to hit a crossover point where the woofer isn't already starting to narrow its directivity or start to beam yeah. before that trouble comes, or that tweeter comes in. So what happens is the woofer directivity narrows and then it gets really wide when the tweeter comes in. And so you can see that in this picture, you've got the flat response and then you've got 45 degrees off axis and you see a dip that's being introduced. That, what that tells you is when you stick that in a room, there's going to be a dip. If you EQ it out, it's going to make the speaker sound bright. So the BBC, in order to compensate for that, actually built the room curve into the speaker. So they actually built the dip into it. And then Odyssey built it into their EQ so that if it wasn't in the speaker, or even if it was, their EQ wouldn't compensate for it. It would actually make sure it stays there because of that directivity change. All of that's well and good with one big problem. What if your speaker actually has really good directivity and there is no mismatch? Mm -hmm. Introducing that dip then actually makes the speaker sound unnatural. And that's why if you're doing an Odyssey setup, we always we usually recommend don't use the Odyssey curve, use the flat curve. Yeah. Or at least uh, you can turn the BBC dip off in the app or with the software. So yeah. I think what we've suggested to just listen both ways because it may be better with it depending on your speakers. Yeah. If you have an I, eight inch I, two way. We got a super chat here, Matt, that you might want to answer. It says from Nicholas Romeranos. Thank you. I use Arc Genesis and my in-room response for my towers has a lot of room gain in the base region well past the tuning points of the speaker. Should I set my targets to suit the tuning of the speaker? I guess he's talking about the room gain from the, uh, the speakers loading into the room. He's getting free gain, basically. Yeah, I mean, I think what you want to do is EQ it again to what sounds right to you and follow the natural curve of the speaker to the extent possible. So if you're getting a lot of extra bass and you like it, just follow it. What you don't want to do is if the speaker, like if you look at that measure, and it's, that's not an in-room measurement, but if you look at that measurement that I have up on the slide there, you can see the bass is rolling off pretty aggressively below 50 Hertz. Let's just say that was an in-room one. Sometimes people are like, oh, well, I want my speaker to extend to 20 Hertz. And so they'll <laughs> take and they'll actually extend the target curve out there and boost the base. You're going to overload the woofer. You yeah, can't do yeah. that. So, or so I, waste, listen, waste amplifier power too. I, yeah. I, I want people to understand that just because you have Odyssey or Dirac or Arc or one of these, and you set this up and you calibrate your room, if you're not happy with the sound, then make adjustments to it. It, it, it I, I rarely, rarely do any of these systems and have a system that sounds the way I want it to sound. So that's why they have the ability to make adjustments on it. Yeah. And we don't, talked about, oh, go ahead. No, just don't think because you run these systems that it's the end all to end all. If you're not happy with the sound, make adjustments on it. Yeah, it's not an that's instant fix. <clears throat> I've never had any, I've never had any of these systems 
that I've ever done on anything sound the way I want them to sound ever. So I'm just saying that that that's something to keep in mind. So this one is just to to tease Don and, and Gene a little bit, but actually I think it's <laughs> to the point that Don you were just making, and that's the bass level. So bass. <laughs> uh, Don, you you like your bass, and Gene's been teasing you about it. And you know what? I like bass too. Gene, even Gene you likes his like bass. bass too. Gene, Gene likes, likes his, his bass, bass absolutely. <laughs> so if you go by this and you say, "Well, trained listeners must have been the ones who who had the best understanding of what the you know most neutral bass was supposed to be," mm -hmm. then clearly the way that Gene, Don, and even myself like our systems tuned is too bass heavy. It's unnatural. But the problem is there really is no way to say any of this is right or wrong. Natural would be against some sort of accurate reference, which in many cases we don't have. Yeah. And so it really is about what you prefer, not about what's neutral or correct. Listen, Matt, and we, you and I have had this conversation a bunch. It, from video with ISF calibration, I've never had an ISF calibration where the client didn't say it was too dark. I want it brighter. And I've never done a calibration on any system where the client didn't want to make adjustments to it, whether it was back, way back in the day with an RTA meter and, and PEQ to these new systems like Odyssey and whatnot. Never had anybody completely happy with the way it ended up. It's all relative to what the person likes. That's just the reality. You can argue this to the cows come home, but it is what it is. Just because the instruments say it's correct doesn't mean it's how you want it. Absolutely. And one thing I add here just for people's sort of point of reference is that if you take a speaker, and we'll just pretend it's a perfect speaker, but relatively wide dispersion, and you measure it anechoically and it's it's perfect, and you stick it in a room, it's going to have a tilt, like I mentioned, about sure. 1 dB per octave probably is pretty typical. Uh, so a rise from 20 kilohertz to 20 hertz or whatever. And here's the reality. That's that black kind of the, the least sloped black line that's over there on the right, that's what that would reflect. That's very rarely people's preferred yeah. curve. Ba Most base, people hear that and think it's base yeah. lacking. Yeah. Basically. Base is the foundation that creates the entire sound. I mean, it is what it is. You, you can't negate the, the power and, and relevance of subwoofers and, and power in a system. It, it's the yeah. foundation. It, it tends to have like an outsized degree of importance. And it's, I've mentioned this to Gene because sometimes he'll tease some of the speakers I like as not being good because they don't have enough bass. <laughs> and my thing on that is, but you can turn the bass up. Like there's a lot of these speakers where it's like, yes, on their own in a room, they don't have enough bass. If, but they, have the the, if they have the headroom to turn the bass headroom. up. I would guess that those re uh, Revels have the headroom. They just need to get turned up. Yeah, they just need more power uh, going uh, to the woofer. Gene, Gene, when we met, I told you my... One of my top two, three speakers in the world was Revel. So I was extremely disappointed that you just just not thrilled with the bass output that you get from those Revels. Then you heard them, and then you heard them. Well, uh, listen, I gotta agree. In your room, we put those Canta number twos, which are a eleven thousand dollars speaker against the sixteen thousand dollars ones, and they just they just sounded better. I mean, yeah, you know, it, you, you agreed, your kids agreed, your wife agreed. <clears throat> you know, I, I, but it doesn't mean I don't love Revel. I think Revel's an amazing speaker. In fact, I know a lot of the experts in the know think Revel's the end all to end all, but you know, it is what it is. Dude. Well, in their defense, they'll play extremely loud and clean. They just need more bass. Oh yeah. They're, they're yeah. fantastic speakers. dude. And they're, I think the fact that they'll play loud means you can turn the bass up. I mean, the Perlissons, yeah. I've mentioned this before, the way that they tune the bass on that was actually very intentional and it makes it a little bit leaner than what you would get with a system that's tuned differently. So here we got, what is a chat? Don is spot on about a calibrated video and client's perception of overall. Brightness. Even a broken clock is right twice a day. <laughs> Tick tock, bitch. So, no, nah, I mean, it's listen, I've done at least 100 home theaters, dude, at least. And I, I've calibrated all sizes and shapes and whatnot. And it's really about what the client likes. That's the bottom line. You know, if you get a system dialed in, start with the basis of calibration, the curve, like Matt says, get it to where it's technically correct. And if that's not technically what you like, then make adjustments to get it what you like. At least you got the foundation because there's certain principles and certain things that have to be done in the system. But, you know, don't be afraid, you know, have your friends over go, oh, I just have my, my TV calibrated, my sound calibrated. And they're like, ah, it doesn't sound that good. You know, make it like you like it. 
that that's yeah. what it boils down to so so matt the bottom line here is when you get linear base response in a room using multi-sub using eq mm -hmm. using good speaker positioning use a good seating position having good room acoustics you set it to this target curve you could simply adjust the base level lower the base level based on what you're listening to based on your you know your preference that's the bottom line is we want to have a linear yep. response and then we could go and boost the base to to our taste and the trouble we've been talking a lot about bass, but the yeah. treble is another one to play around with and and to be honest tone controls are almost perfectly set for where you want to be having your knees for that so for those who want to play around with this and you don't feel like playing around with adjustments to the target curve right away as long as your system has normal old-fashioned tone controls called bass and treble <laughs> raise and lower those because typically and i think probably 90 plus percent of systems i've measured the base control is a shelf filter centered at 100 hertz which mm -hmm. if you it's a, literally a shelf filter it, it tends to have this kind of it's not flat actually it rises per octave and yeah, low like frequencies a, yeah low q and then uh, and the treble, it's the same thing. It's centered, I think, around one kilohertz instead, or I think that's right. No, 10 kilohertz. No, 10 kilohertz. 10 kilohertz. 10 yeah. kilohertz and 100 hertz. That's Some right. of the older receivers used to have a super bass control that was like 50 hertz. Right, right. 10 kilohertz. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so play with those. And then, so like what I'll do is I'll let, raise the bass six decibels. Okay. So clearly I want six decibels of boost. And then I'll go in and change my target curve to better match that. And, and have presets. You could have presets. Yeah, yeah. For exactly. And I do. I like to do multiple presets if you can do that. So, direct you can do that with Odyssey. You can't. I think you have to kind of set it and reload it. Right. I'm not familiar with. Well, that you stuff. have different speaker uh, settings in in a Denon or Marantz receiver. You've got like three, two or three different settings. So you could easily flip between which ones you prefer. Okay. So what I usually do is is a three to six decibel difference in the bass, and also some adjustments to the treble, and then that way, yeah. thing on the recording. Matt, we should do a video, Gene, as well, um, on the difference between Dirac and Odyssey and Arc and Wipow and, and, and some of these systems out there. That'd be a great video to do just to kind yes, of Yes, and I volunteer Matt to do all of the measurements on all the systems in the same room to do <laughs> Well, we don't have to get well, that's, that. Deep. That's why we haven't done it yet. People keep asking. And I think you have all of them at your house right I now. I do Gene. have them all in different rooms. I, I, have, I have, yeah, I've got them all. I've got a fair number of them here, but yeah, we, we do. It's just, it is a lot of work. It all is. right. So I, I, I Dirac is definitely more involved. It is. Um, all right. So I want to move on to the studio business. And the reason I want to get into this is that this was actually, so originally I had been hearing this idea that a lot of studio guys liked a flat target curve. I mean, dead flat and that they like to listen that way. And I kept thinking that just doesn't make sense. There's a whole lot of reasons why you wouldn't want to listen that way psychoacoustically. And so I started right. actually doing, oh, yeah. um, oh, and Trinov and, and um, yep. Room Perfect Trinov definitely Room should Perfect. be included. Yep. Yes, uh, yep. Trinov would be an I've... easier one. I don't have Room Perfect or access to um, Lingers products at the moment. Tr Trinov's the king, I admit it. <laughs> it's a really, really good processor. And the, the king is good. the king. So, all right. So, um, I had heard about this flat response idea. It didn't make sense to me. And then I actually got some jobs doing, uh, studio designs and was talking to them about how we were going to calibrate the system. So, um, one of the clients I have right now, who for all I know, may be watching this, um, he actually had, we, he and I talked about it, but I had talked to somebody else about it as well. And they both basically said the same thing, which was that. You want to calibrate it flat because you're going to then add a, essentially a different calibration to it when you do a remix for different uses. And so you need a flat response to build upon, which is actually speaking of Trinov, that's how Trinov works. It makes a perfectly flat response. Then it applies your target curve. And that's essentially what uh, you would do in the studio. Now there are guys who actually misunderstand that and are in fact listening to a flat system and think that's better. But for the most part, one of the reasons why the idea of calibrating the studio flat came to be was because there isn't one version of the music. You've got your radio play version. You've got your streaming yep. version. You've got Bingo. your you know CD version or whatever it's going to be. And so because they were making different mixes for different purposes, they needed to start with something that didn't already have some sort of a curve in it. So they didn't inadvertently EQ that out for the other uh, uh, or EQ it in, I guess, uh, for the other. M Matt, version. that's a great point because there are several different mixes for different formats. 
that they put out there. Same with movies too. It is as, as example more so. THX. Yeah. Yeah. So when I when I first set up spatial audio in my family room system, I the, the first song I put on was a Post Malone rock star, right? Because my kids mm -hmm. listen to that song. Killer. Don, you kind of you introduced me to that song. It's yeah, a it's killer. So I'm I'm familiar with how that bass level in that song is when I listen to it in my car, or listen to it in two channel. As soon as when I put the Atmos version on, it felt like the bass was 10 or 15 dB too hot. And I was like, oh, I screwed up the calibration of my system. Yeah, yeah. So then I had to go and test it on two other systems in my house. Yeah. And sure enough, the it Atmos the mix of that song is way too bass heavy. Way now, too I've bass been, heavy. I've been listening to a bunch of Atmos through both Tidal and Apple music, and they they vary greatly. Yeah. It, it, you, you 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 calibrate your system then you you put media into it and it's all different all over the board it's my it, it mind-boggling you know what i mean storm audio actually has an lfe dim feature so if you're listening to a multi-channel surround and the bass is too high you just hit it and it literally cuts the lfe i, I think it's like six or eight db so you don't have to go and mess with your settings. you just hit that one button and magically it sounds right i did that to the post malone thing and i liked it that's what I mean. There's no perfect calibration. And well, and it, this, it'd drive you crazy. For sure. And this goes to that idea of the circle of confusion. I mean, at the end of the day, all recordings are going to sound a little bit different. Some are going to sound a lot different. And you got to have some different presets or some different ways to adjust the bass and treble to make each one sound right to you. Yeah. yeah. Just like when Gene calibrates the system and you calibrate the system, Matt, it's a little bit different. I mean, you guys are real close, sure. but... I bet we calibrate pretty differently. <laughs> so wow. uh, circles, uh, the circle of confusion and room curves, as I mentioned, big difference between creating the art and appreciating the art. So again, appreciating the art, that's what we're doing. We're listening, we're enjoying. You should make this something you like and not worry about what's going on in the studios. It's a big unknown that the studio engineers got it right. So creating a massive variety of recording quality and even timbre of those recordings. So. We've talked about that a bunch of times already. And as such, there's no one roof curve that's going to work for all recordings. And it's best to have presets that adjust the bass and treble levels in three to six decibel increments to work Bingo. better for different recordings. Matt, when you calibrate a system, if the the pre-pro or the processor is capable, do you usually do two or three different variations on that for the client? Yeah, yeah, I've mentioned that a few times now. Um, so I always try to offer one that's sort of the neutral one. We'll call it the one that's closest to that kind of Harmon target we were showing earlier. One that has about three decibels of extra bass, and I might take the trouble that's down it? a bit. Well, and then I'll do another one that's maybe <laughs> six. But then I'll have, let's say, Don, let's say you're the client. I'll have you listen to it, and I'll give you like a week. Because I'll, I'll say to you, we can do it right now. Listen to it. Tell me if you think something's wrong. But I really would prefer you to spend like a week with it. Because I want you to be able to take all the recordings that you listen to on a routine basis mm -hmm. and uh, all the movies and then come back to me and tell me what's good and what's not good. I right, might I'm even take, give you some. I'm taking notes right for now. next year when you come and calibrate next my year. system. I need day. to come up sooner than that. <laughs> so, so I even might give you some questions to answer for me to kind of help me. Then what we do is we'll go back and we'll adjust it again based on what you've said. Perfect. Perfect. And then that way, hopefully that second time is right. Now, maybe the first time was right. Maybe we come back that, and you're that's, like, that's oh, the only way to do it really is that it's not a show up and do it and leave and it's perfect process. You know that. Yeah. Well, and I will say it's one of the reasons why the show up and leave. I mean, if somebody, and I get clients all over the country and I've had clients in other countries as well, and I get people who talk to me who want to have me do calibrations really far away. And I always get a little bit nervous because if I can work with them directly and they can make the changes themselves, then I can tell them what to do. It's fine. We can go through the process we just mentioned. But if it's something where I have to fly in and do it, then it means I might have to fly back, you know, a second time a week later. So, which is so an awful Matt, lot tell, for this. Tell everybody your new role with Trenov here in, in Florida on the East Coast. Oh, well, I don't know if that's something I can talk about yet, actually. Oh, all right. My bad. Sorry. <laughs> Beep. Well, one thing, I, one thing I want to mention, one thing I want to mention about the whole calibration process and doing remote calibration is a tricky business because you'll get people that, that say, oh, yeah, I could just dial in your system and get the perfect response. If you're getting someone to do that, whether it's Matt, myself, or anyone else that does remote calibrations, even Gramani does, I think, some of that as well. Make sure they're not just calibrating for one mic position or one seat. I mean, you yeah. want you want good response from multitude of seats. A lot of these uh, these guys that are getting new to this stuff, 
oh, they measure everything. They line everything up to one point in a microphone. That's not how we hear. In fact, uh, Matt, you, you're big on doing spatial averages. You've got a mic multiplexer array, so you can make like six, seven measurements at one time. So you can really understand what sample, what's going on in the room and then make correct or intelligent uh, corrections to EQ and set your levels accordingly. Yeah. So when I measure a room, whether I do it that way or another way, um, typically what I try to do is sample the room and then focus in on a certain area. So right, you guys can't see all the chairs in my room, but I've got six, three in the front, three in the back, right? The one I'm sitting in is the center of the front row. It's my primary listening position. This is where I want to emphasize everything. Now, emphasize in the primary listening position still does not mean one microphone. Yeah. So ideally, maybe five measurements in just this position alone. Over here, I might do another five. Over here, I might do another five. And in the back seats, I do the same thing. And I'm going to do them all around because look at my head. First off, I'm moving it around. It's mm. not in one place. The microphone could be like right here, but my ears are here and here, right? And I might sit like this. I might sit like this. I might recline it. And so I need it to sound good in all of those positions. So what I have to do is sample essentially all of the sound in all of those positions. And then I average that in order to get a sense of how I want to uh, you know, do the target curve. All the other ones I use as well, but I actually don't typically use as many of those or even any of them in the averaging. It would depend a lot. If I wanted to make sure everything was on average good for everybody, but better, maybe a better way of putting it is it's, it's equally bad for everybody, then yeah. sure, I'll average every single one. But yeah. at the end of the day, Gene, I think you feel the same way. Don, probably you too. This is my system. I want it to sound good for me, and I don't want to compromise it for me so that it sounds a little bit better mm. for the guy sitting next yeah, to me. Yeah, that might take 12 hours with Dirac, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I, I don't like having really bad seats, though. I know I, Don's like the same way. He's like, Gene, you got to give it a rest. The whole front row of your system is awesome. But when I measure that suck out in the back row, I, I deem that the mother-in-law seat. I still – I will go – hours or days trying to really tune it in without messing yeah, up the but, other response but who gives a shit dude the back rows for your guests when they come over <laughs> i know I, still, I mean yeah. seriously we design our systems for our our sweet spot i mean that's yeah, just reality look and it's still better in the back row than 99 percent of anything yeah, you're exactly. ever gonna hear you know yeah. what i mean come on yeah. we got to be real about this you do all right, so let's talk a little bit about constant directivity speakers, typically using waveguide. So on the right, you can see at the top is a measurement of a KLH speaker, which is not a constant directivity speaker. You can see the directivity varies. Below that, uh, it's a JBL. Uh, that speaker is constant directivity. You can see that on the very flat DI. The one below, that's a Getty speaker also flat. It doesn't show the DI, but you can see in the response, it's, it's showing what a constant directivity speaker would do. So here's an issue. Now, Gettys had mentioned this to me back when I first had gotten my Getty speakers many years ago, quite close to 10 years at this point, which was that we both had noted that when the speakers were set up in a room and EQ'd the way you would typically EQ a speaker, they tended to sound a little bright. And that we were, That's both of us bright. were imparting a little bright. We were both imparting more of a slope than seemed like should be ideal. And we were talking about why that might be. And he had mentioned that you know, with a constant directivity speaker, you're getting more direct sound at high frequencies and uh, less reflected sound over a wider bandwidth than is typical. Because remember, people often think of these constant directivity speakers as being narrow directivity. And in the mid range, they are narrower than something like that KLH. But at the high frequencies, they're all beaming, right? The tweeters of pretty much every wide dispersion speaker is still not wide dispersion. Yeah. And so, the reason why it probably sounds a bit bright and why there needed to be more of a tilt to the response was that in that mid-range area, the speaker had a lot uh, more, less sound energy, there we go, than would have been typical that's reflecting around the room uh, than these other speakers. But actually on a, a kind of ratio basis, there was more of a balance between the mid-range and the treble than what we would be used to with this wider dispersion speaker. And so you need to actually tilt it more to compensate. This is all kind of theory. I don't think anyone really knows. It just seems to be that because of that different directivity of that kind of a speaker, they seem to sound better that way. Uh, Anthony and I were talking about this as well, and he said the same thing, that typically with CD speakers, especially those that have higher DIs, a little bit more narrow directivity over a wider bandwidth, 
seem to sound better when you tilt the response more. So mm. is that the newer KLH? Because my generation KLH was absolute garbage. <laughs> uh, it's one of the right. newer. Yeah. Yeah. That's oh, still so like still Walmart figures, right? All right, so let's talk about Gene. Gene, you've been wanting to show off your measurements. I think that's why we threw this in here. Yeah, there you go. Uh, it, it looks pretty good. So this is Gene's preferred target curve. And, you know, I, so I just want to say that blue curve is not actually Gene's target curve. Gene kind of established his own target curve in his head and EQ'd the system to be what he likes. And then well, I just applied yeah. a target to it afterwards to show you guys what like a smooth line going through it might look like. 278 hours. I of mean, it is, there is, a, there is about a 10 dB difference between 20 kilohertz and 20 or 20 hertz. I mean, it's a little bit more than 10 dB, but it's almost. I mean, I think you're 15. It's yeah, you're about 15. 85 down to, yeah, maybe. Yeah. By 20 I mean, kilohertz, you're at less than 70. Put you know, it this way when Don comes over, he's like, you need more bass. You do need more bass, man. And look Come at on, that bass, dude. dude. You need. Way more bass in that room, dude. Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. Matt, comes over, Matt comes over. Matt goes, you know, this like some bullshit. Balance, right? It's not. <laughs> it's true. It's I it's usually not. think it's got too much bass. You know what you're yeah. you know what you're missing in that curve, Matt? You're you missing on the more on, on the secondary y axis. You need a level for testosterone. Oh yeah. <laughs> according to Sean Olive, the higher your testosterone, the more bass you want. Yeah, but look at that dude. He's like skeletor, really? <laughs> oh gosh. You're gonna talk to me about Sean what Sean Olive likes? He's got cats. We <laughs> love Sean Olive. All right. I sorry, Sean. Yeah, he's great. He's great. Love you, Sean. All but right. So um need this, more is, this is some in-room measurements. This is I think this is out of order. I don't know why I put this one here. It was just yeah. to show you guys how different speakers measure in a room. So actually one of these was measured in a different room, two of them in the same room. So the RBH 8300s and uh, the Revel F328BEs were measured in the same room, basically in roughly the same location. I do think, though, did you tell me, I didn't realize this when I threw it in here. Did you tell me, Gene, that a wall went up in between those two measurements? Yeah, so that Revel measurement I sent you was after I put that wall up, and it actually created a, a suck out at 40 hertz. Um, <clears throat> so the so base maybe... level... The base level should be similar to what was the RBH one, and the Revel, uh, the RBH actually has more treble than the Revel. You can see that. And more then treble the, than the Revel? More Revel, treble Revel, than the Revel. Revel, Revel. And then the the far right red one, we should have changed the color on that. That's the Paralysons in my family room, so that's a different system. Right. Um, but in terms of natural room shape, you can still get a kind of sense of how each of these ones uh, measured. And what it does show is the Revel, yeah, had a little bit more of a downward tilt in the response. The perlicin seemed to kind of split the difference as more base because it had a subwoofer attached to it. And yeah. um, the uh, RBH is actually the flattest in room. And so they tended to be, they would probably be the brightest sounding, although they I know- They definitely were brighter than the Revels, yeah. Yeah. Well, they'll stand Rebel. out in the crowd. Revel, Revel. All right, so then this There's is- There's the Donimus curve Don. right there. <laughs> Don versus Gene. So I just lined up basically the response that we got. So one is a spatial average of uh, Gene. No, that's not a spatial average. That's actually just, okay. So what I did was smooth these. So you're not looking at all the little imperfections yeah. in the response and instead kind of focused on the trends. And so as a general trend, you can see that below 200 Hertz, Don likes quite a bit more bass than Gene does. <laughs> But, I, was, I was there tuning that for him, and I was laughing the whole time because it's it's like an amusement park ride, man. You got to experience a Don. System. You got to experience that shit was a bomb, wasn't it? Jim? It was. I was pissing, man. <laughs> my, we put on Atmos my, music. My, my whole my whole section was like, was like right at Disney World. <laughs> well, you know it's what, what I don't give a shit. I like twelves, four eight, four eighteens, and four twelves for now. I got a twenty one coming too. There you go. So here's the thing I want to point out, though. Don's measurements are not wrong. That's what Don likes. And yeah. That's okay. That's right. I, you know, after spending some time at Don's house listening, I, I was like, this is pretty cool. It really it is, is cool. Like, it, it's an amusement park. I like it's it. It's nice to have amusement park mode. It's, yeah. That Listen, when you're watching a movie and, and, the, and explosions and stuff happens, man, it's just surreal. Dude, what was I that mean, Brad it, Pitt movie we were watching where he's running people over with tanks? Oh, uh, Fury. That is yeah, that's, awesome. That's a, when we watch that on the system. Yeah, that's a great. I got to write that down. Even, um, even Brian with the active system like yours is like, that sounds better in a lot of ways than mine. You know what I mean? Like, I just, I like, I like bass heavy stuff. I always have. I was in the car stereo in the 80s. 
I just, I mean, it's not to the point where it's ridiculous, where it makes it sound no, unnatural. It's ridiculous. it's ridiculous. Yeah, well, whatever, it. dude. It's ridiculous. It's good. Listen, All everybody right. likes what they like. They do. Yeah. And that actually, I think, is the point of today's presentation, was really about right. trying to dispel the idea that there's a correct or accurate curve that we should all be EQing to. Because I, I hear people all the time, they're like, I tried it and I didn't like it, but it's supposed to be right. So I left it there. And I'm like, why'd you leave it? Yeah. If you didn't like it, change it. It's your system. Let's so this is, a point, this is a point that you should address because I think people are still confused. And if someone says, uh, is it me that only likes a flat curve? Didn't mess with the work of a sound engineer. So nobody likes a flat in room curve. That's no. much different than a speaker that's linear and flat and echoic versus putting it in a room. Yeah, so when you're going with that tilted response, you're not messing with what the sound engineer did. That's not really the right way to think about it. You can like that, though. If you like a flat curve, that is something some people prefer. Um, that's fine. Then that's how you should listen to it. But uh, a, when you take a speaker that actually has a completely neutral response, meaning its response is flat, and you stick it in a normal room, the response isn't flat anymore. It has a tilt to it. And yeah. that has to do with with uh, the way that the speaker uh produces sound the, the the directivity of it so um if you actually undo that and you make it have a flat in-room response what you've done is you've actually altered the response and the yeah. ratio of bass to treble which with most recordings is not going to sound natural most people would find that to be too lean but if you like it that's fine and that's again that's sort of the point yeah you just got to set it to where you like it because i listen to everything from diana crawl to ready player one and and I like that kind of compromise. I mean, I could go a lot higher in the bass, and it's not that. I could bad. hear bass when Don puts on music that just has flutes. I could hear the bass. I could hear the breath in the guys when he's a, taking a breath and blowing into the flute. You feel it on yeah. your couch when you listen to Don's yeah. system. The jeans and the flutes. <laughs> All right. So, oh gosh, <laughs> I just got that slowly. <laughs> I'm open. I'm open. <laughs> Now, right. you know what's cool is everybody here at Audiolics, we're all obsessed with sound. I mean, we truly are. And we all like what we like. And we, we're always, you know, we razz each other, but we're always listening to each other's systems and checking it out. It's fun. I mean, that's the beauty of this hobby. Don't don't get so amped up on it that it's got to be one way. You know, I, I love the idea of multiple sound curves for the things you're listening to. You can pick one for music, maybe one for movies. I think that's the way to go. So absolutely. So to wrap this up, and maybe this is a topic for another follow-up video. My thoughts are a lot of these auto room correction systems, like I've been using Odyssey over the last 10 or 15 years. Teo Nicolakis is another one I'm very familiar with Odyssey. He came to the same conclusions as me. And I'm Teo's not just picking man. on Odyssey, but a lot of these auto correction systems tend to um set the base level too low like i go and run odyssey and then i gotta oh, go turn the base especially forward. wipeout wipeout oh well wipeout up until last year didn't do anything for base so at flat. least they're doing yeah, at least they're doing something now for base but but when i ran odyssey i always noticed i had to turn the sub up for maybe 6 db it did linearize the response but the, i think their targets i think some of these room correction system targets are not right and uh, that's why you need to have the ability to adjust. And I was talking to Anthony earlier today, and he's like, anytime you run auto EQ, you always have to go in and, and make adjustments. So you, yeah. it, it it's never like they adjust, adjust it for the European or Asian markets where they don't really care that much about base. There are differences really in the markets for sure. Well, yeah. for, no, totally. Yeah. That, that's a real thing. It's not just hyperbole, you know what I mean? Yeah, actually, I so one of my friends in the industry who uh, – makes headphones uh, was had done some listening tests in different countries and his products are produced in China. And one of his biggest markets is China. And he was saying that he was doing all the listening tests in the U S because that's where he's based. And he was finding that not a lot of people didn't prefer some of the headphones he was producing. So he started introducing different versions, which basically just adjusted the base and trouble level. Um, but he was finding that in China specifically, um, and he did some control listening tests to confirm this, they liked less bass than they do in the U S and then yeah. I forget where, but there was another country he had done some listening tests in where the general average preference was for a lot more bass than even us crazy Americans. Yeah, I hear that the government banned anything below 40 hertz in China. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> yes, communism hates bass. That's right, Don. They hate bass. Yeah. Well, guys, I hope you found this video useful. Um, we're going to be definitely doing more follow-ups on this. In fact, 
I'm going to be doing a um, breakout session at Audio Advice next week. I'm going to be at the show, actually this weekend, Saturday. We're going to be talking about getting your room calibration right. We're going to have some subject matter experts mm -hmm. there as well. And then Matt, Don, we're going to be at Cedia next month. We're going to be doing yes, some live streams at Sound United. We're going to be talking more about room calibrations, room correction systems. So this is not a topic that we're we're just covering one time and ending it. We're going to continue to do this. And Matt is going to come over to my place when he's allowed to leave his house. And uh, <laughs> I talk, bitch. <laughs> exactly. Really? Don't, really? Don't throw stones really? in the glass house. Yeah. Oh, no, my I'm, God. Oh I'm going to have Matt here, and we're going to be doing <laughs> – we're going to run Odyssey on my system again. We're going to mess yeah. around with DRAC and do follow-up videos. So this is a very compelling subject. I'd rather be talking about this subject than messing around with cables Jane, because this can, is what really makes impact to the sound. And can, we want to make I sure you guys about get it right. Audio, audio advice. Let me tell you, those, those, those guys and gals, that, that is a hell of a good place to buy your equipment. I mean, yeah. I'm an integrator and I sell equipment. But I'm telling you, they 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 are passionate. Besides, this, a lot of times people just sell it because it's a business and profitable. But these people, audio advice, are passionate about what they do, and they're passionate about the systems that they put together, and they're very picky about the companies that they use to install their sub. I, I have to say, as a professional integrator at the highest level, these these guys and gals are amazing. Audio Vice is a damn good company. Yeah, they really are. They really are. All right. Well, is there anything else you guys want to add? Or we uh, is this a wrap up? I think we're good. Yeah. We call Matt Pose. Call Matt Pose for your calibration needs. He's amazing. Yep. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. I mean, we're actually. I, I don't really announce it too much on YouTube because I can't keep up with the demand. But I do uh, consultation services as a pop up on our website, and then when it gets he really does. deep, and you want to do room design, and you want to do noise mitigation, or any type of really deep system Sound planning. Cool. Of course, I refer yeah. to Matt and Don. I, and I, I, and I, I use Matt on all my big systems and my sound mitigation in different rooms. The, the guy is just absolutely a genius. And I know he gets a little weird when I say that, but you'll, you won't find anybody in the industry better than Matthew Pose at, at, at really. If you're going to spend some money and set a system up, that's the guy to go to. And talk to Gene. Gene will get you 90 or 80% there and Matt will close the He's the short game, seriously. Yeah, man, that's that's what we're all about. We don't want yep. to tell you guys we're to throw more money at equipment. Get the room right. Yeah. Get your calibration we're, right. Get your setup right. And you get have access to all of us. We're all a team. Don't Except forget for about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audiohawks. We appreciate your support. You get direct access to me if you want to suggest topics or ask questions. And until next time, my friends, keep, keep listening. listening. Haven's